so the topic of my today's presentation will be uh, two-dimensional materials for electronic applications. And um, originally I planned it uh, to be primarily focused on uh, the students of uh, the Department of Material Science at Moscow State University, my alma mater. And uh, when I coordinated this lecture with uh, Professor Gudilin, um, the like, vice head of the department, uh, I asked him specifically uh, how much uh, students at the department know about two-dimensional materials. So at, at the time when I was studying, so it was like in uh, early 2000s, uh, there were no two-dimensional materials, so they were just appearing, and uh, there were no lecture content on them. So I actually learned on them after I defended my PhD in 2008, um, when I started my postdoc uh, with Jim Tour at Rice University. So later in 2011, I started my own group and the two-dimensional materials uh, became the primary topic of my research. But uh, again, since uh, I wasn't sure like, you know, how much material is actually delivered on these exciting structures nowadays, I asked specifically, okay, well, how far uh, should I start from the beginning? And the answer is no, that, uh, well, basically there's no like specific course, special topic course uh, or whatsoever on them. That's why I actually included uh, an, an extensive introduction uh, to two-dimensional materials. And um, honestly, I feel like uh, this lecture will not be uh, uh, just about like, you know, promoting my own research, uh, but uh, also educating um, younger students about this incredibly large field. And I hope that the most important message uh, of this lecture will be that uh, two-dimensional materials are very diverse. They offer a lot in terms of uh, properties and applications. And uh, whatever research topic you're working on, uh, it will be most likely that uh, some of those two-dimensional materials could be helpful to what you're doing. Okay, so first, uh, again, well, since, uh, like I said, I will have an extensive introduction, let me start from the basics. And I think that this uh, part uh, is something which people even outside of academia know very well. So the story of graphene. So that there is a, a very well-known graphite crystal. So we have it uh, everywhere, including the pencil leads. And if you look at the graphite structure, you see that it consists of uh, two-dimensional layers uh, where you have very strong uh, bonding uh, between the carbon atoms, but a very weak interaction between the layers. And this interaction is so weak that uh, even if you apply a weak force, like a force of adhesion from a scotch tape, this, fo this force will be sufficient to isolate uh, those layers and create uh, two-dimensional uh, sheets of graphene such as shown here. And uh, this story was very popular because, um, for a number of reasons. First of all, uh, it's uh, well, a story which resulted in a new structure. And also it's a very simple story, something in which um, science journalists uh, would have no problems communicating to their audience because everybody knows what graphite is and everybody knows what scotch tape is. And also that uh, even with such simple tools, uh, one could uh, make a, an important discovery and uh, get a Nobel Prize. So these two uh, were very well-known scientists, uh, Andre Geim and Konstantin Novoselov, received a Nobel Prize in physics for this in 2010. Okay, well, uh, of course, uh, when you read this, um, um, like uh, you may ask a question, like, is it really that simple? Like, is it really like just all it takes that you take a crystal, put a piece of scotch tape, peel it off, and you get gra uh, graphene? And the answer is yes. So this schematic actually shows exactly, you know, how crystals of graphene are isolated. And uh, it's really as simple as it sounds. So right now in my group, uh, there are students who are making graphene uh, samples uh, on a regular basis. And if you do this procedure like within an hour or so with practice, of course, you can get a very nice crystals of graphene. So you put a crystal of graphite on a scotch tape, press it against a substrate of choice, uh, such as silicon oxide or glass. And once you peel off uh, this, the piece, this piece of scotch tape, some graphene layers will remain on the substrate. So these are the images from the original paper by Gaiman Novoselov, uh, published in Science in uh, 2004. 
And uh, in those optical images, like in A, you actually see uh, a crystal of graphene. So in this case, it's uh, probably a few layer graphene, but uh, single layer graphene would look quite similar. Uh, also very important was that uh, in that original publication, they actually not just showed that such uh, exfoliation is possible, but also that uh, the uh, crystals of graphene could be patterned into uh, two-dimensional devices, uh, such as shown in uh, panels E and D. And uh, they measured the electronic properties of graphene and showed that it's a um, gapless uh, semiconductor or a semi-metal, depending on the definition. So uh, that was already sufficient to uh, attract interest, but the field uh, really started growing very rapidly when it was demonstrated that actually uh, it's not just about electronic properties, but other physical properties of graphene are as remarkable. So I have already mentioned this original paper and a number of uh, follow-up uh, measurements by Geim and other groups showed that graphene has uh, very high uh, carrier mobilities. So mobility is basically a measure of how fast the charge carriers move in the material. So in this case, the numbers are extraordinary. So such as uh, over 200,000 uh, centimeters square per volt second. So it's, it's, very, um, it's a very high number. So then uh, you have uh, very high conductivity, and uh, that would be comparable to the best metals like copper or silver. And uh, graphene could also withstand uh, very high current densities. Now, um, electrical properties is not just it. Uh, if you look at the mechanical properties of graphene, and uh, they could be measured, for example, by creating uh, two-dimensional membranes, as shown in this schematic and then uh, testing the elasticity of uh, those membranes with a tip of an atomic force microscope. So if you do this measurement, uh, you will find that uh, graphene uh, has uh, extremely high Young's modulus. So it's much higher than, than that of steel, for example, and other construction materials. It's highly elastic and flexible. So, and uh, one um, example which we can often um, provide in this field is that, uh, like to illustrate how strong graphene is, is that if you have a sheet of uh, paper or basically uh, a stack of graphene layers with the thickness of a sheet of paper, then put a pencil on top of it and then put an elephant on, on the pencil. So then, uh, well, graphene uh, stack would be strong enough to withstand uh, such uh, well, weight. So it's quite impressive. So, and uh, then uh, the optical property measurements followed, and uh, they also showed uh, some interesting properties. So the optical transparency of graphene uh, was found to be uh, about uh, 98%, and uh, this value could be seen uh, from different uh, points of view. So on one hand, one can say that uh, yeah, it's a very small number. So for example, if you have an electronic circuit for flexible and transparent electronics, uh, only 2% absorption is very small and you wouldn't see uh, your graphene devices. So you can basically see through graphene, right? So that's advantageous for those applications. On the other hand, you can also make a case that this number is very high, right? Because for a material that is only about uh, 3.4 angstroms thick, to absorb as much as 2% of light, it's, it's a lot, right? And uh, that number uh, makes it possible to create um, photodetectors, um, um, optical transistors, and so on and so forth. So this opens a, a wide field of optoelectronics based on graphene. And one other remarkable property here is that this number of uh, optical transparency it does not depend on the wavelength, such that uh, whether it's a green light or a blue light or red light, uh, so that number could stand. And uh, another uh, property which I want to mention is uh, thermal conductivity. So the Bolandin group uh, did uh, such measurements uh, in around uh, 2008 and showed that uh, graphene has an extremely high thermal conductivity. It's about uh, 5,000 um, uh, watts per meter Kelvin. And um, that, that, that's a very uh, nice property as well, because if you're talking about electronic devices based on graphene, uh, the heat management uh, would not be such an issue as for silicon-based devices. 
So all of these properties coupled with other um, characteristics such as a very high theoretical specific surface area uh, of about uh, 2600 meters square per gram, uh, a lot of uh, interesting physical phenomena such as quantum Hall effect and so on, explain why graphene is widely regarded as a promising material for many applications. So uh, if you look at what has been proposed uh, for graphene, uh, it's uh, a pretty impressive suite of applications. Um, so you can use either of these properties or a combination of, the, of those properties uh, to create um, electronics, uh, optoelectronics, uh, photovoltaics, uh, various composite materials, and so on. And uh, one thing which really illustrates that uh, people had a lot of trust, you know, in graphene and in its future is this program uh, mentioned here called Graphene Flagship. And it was a 1 billion euro uh, initiative by the European Union uh, uh, with, a, it with an aim to promote the commercialization of graphene and the drive it toward applications. So it's a pretty remarkable initiative and uh, well, quite a number of good things came out of it. So uh, of course, if you look at those applications, a good question is like, do you always need to make uh, such a scotch tape experiment to create graphene samples? And uh, the answer is no. Actually, uh, over the years, people developed uh, a number of different techniques for making graphene. And I really like this uh, schematic from um, Novoselov's review in Nature, uh, which shows those techniques uh, as a function, if you will, of uh, quality and price. So on one hand, uh, you can have um, a very uh, inexpensive uh, solution processed graphene, so which would not have as high of a quality as, as the um, mechanically exfoliated samples, but it really could be made uh, well, in pretty much any amounts you want. And uh, this would be very attractive for composite materials, energy storage devices, and so on. On the other hand, if you want, for example, to have um, um, like large scale sheets of graphene, let's say to pattern large electronic circuits, uh, this could be done by chemical vapor deposition or CVD mentioned here. And this gives you a high quality material on a large scale. So a very famous picture uh, from uh, Samsung is shown in this uh, sl uh, slide where you see a sheet of graphene as large as uh, 30 inch in the diagonal and dimension. So that's kind of like a size of a plasma TV. Uh, or again, if you want to make graphene on a large scale, you can use solution exfoliation and produce uh, like buckets uh, of uh, uh, liquid processable uh, material. So uh, in terms of uh, just graphene, uh, I would say that uh, the community was really occupied uh, with its properties uh, for about like five or six years since 2004. And uh, people originally didn't pay that much attention to this paper shown here. And uh, you see it came uh, out as early as in 2005. Uh, which showed that actually uh, this uh, scotch tape approach uh, doesn't work just with graphene. So in principle, you can have uh, any other uh, layered material, such as, for example, uh, molybdenum disulfide shown here, or other transition metal dichalcogenides, where instead of molybdenum, you may have uh, tungsten, uh, for example, and instead of um, sulfur, you may have selenium or tellurium. And uh, just like in graphite, uh, in those materials, you would have strong covalent bonding within the layers, but only weak uh, van der Waals interactions between the layers. So if you apply uh, a scotch tape to, to the surface uh, of a crystal like that, you can also exfoliate uh, monolayers, bilayers, and so on. And uh, that was shown again in this paper where you see very thin crystals of uh, niobium diselenide, for instance, or MOS2, and so on. But again, uh, in the early days of uh, research and 2D materials, uh, pretty much everybody was uh, working on graphene and this was kind of unnoticed for, uh, for a while. I mean, there were still lots of citations, but not as much research on those other materials as on graphene. However, if you look at uh, what happened around like 2010 or 2011, like when actually the Nobel Prize was awarded, 
it was a time when people already realized uh, how good graphene is and uh, already found its remarkable properties and they really shifted their attention to other 2D materials. So for example, in case of uh, the MOIS2, there was uh, this particular paper which showed uh, very nice uh, field effect uh, transistors, you know, like electronic devices, uh, based on MOIS2. And the thing is that uh, even though graphene is outstanding, it cannot do everything. So in terms of uh, digital electronics, uh, graphene, which is the most conductive material we know, would be too conductive uh, to create uh, high on-off ratios in uh, field effect transistors. So in a device like this, if you want to use it for logic applications, you want uh, to, to be able to switch it on, to basically make this channel material conductive, and uh, switch it off to make it non-conductive. And graphene is, is too conductive uh, to give you an isolating state. But for MOIS2, which is a semiconductor by nature, uh, and it has a band gap of about 1.6 EV, uh, this is not a problem. And as a result, for this particular application, uh, MOIS2 would work much better. And uh, the measurements show that, yes, you can modulate the current, which is the um, y-axis in this graph, by many orders of magnitude. And uh, this really uh, opened, uh, well, not just this paper, but like uh, the number of papers that came out uh, about this time, opened uh, the, a much larger field than originally. And uh, nowadays, we don't just think about graphene, if we think about two-dimensional materials, but about many other exciting structures as well. So I've already mentioned the uh, MOIS2, so which would belong to this family of uh, transition metal dichalcogenides, and there are dozens of different structures uh, within this family. Uh, they're mostly semiconductors, but they have different band gaps and can suit to different applications. Uh, there is a hexagonal boron nitride, which is a dielectric uh, and can also be isolated into a single layer form. So if you look at uh, the uh, semiconductors within this family, so they are mostly N-type semiconductors. Uh, however, you can also have uh, P-type semiconductors within the two-dimensional uh, material family. And a good example would be black phosphorus or phosphorine. So in this case, you would also have another elemental uh, 2D material, uh, which could also be exfoliated into uh, 2D sheets, which would look a structure, which would have a structure like this. And yeah, those would be P-type semiconductors, which would make them, in a sense, complementary to uh, TMDs. And many others, like for example, I know that uh, a couple of weeks ago, Professor Gagotze from uh, Drexel University had a, a nice lecture on maxines. So this is this very large family of materials, which offer uh, a lot in terms of properties and in terms of electronic properties, uh, as I will talk about uh, later, uh, they're primarily metallic. So, and again, they complement nicely other structures that you have here. So that's another chart which basically shows the same idea that uh, whichever property in terms of electronics uh, you want, like you want an insulator, a semiconductor, half metal, a semi-metal, there's now a material for this uh, within this large family of 2D materials. And that, that's already exciting. So if you want to create uh, some new device or new structure, so you really have a lot of materials to choose from. But if you think that uh, the, this uh, breadth of uh, structures uh, that you have in a monolayer form is just it, uh, so you'd be wrong because actually um, the field uh, offers much more than that. So I already said that, okay, well, uh, the band gaps could be different. Uh, but also in terms of uh, uh, valuable properties uh, for the uh, device applications, uh, you see that uh, there were a number of recent papers on uh, two-dimensional ferroelectric materials. I'll talk about ferroelectrics in a moment, but uh, uh, this property in uh, a two-dimensional form is a very recent discovery. So then uh, there are some examples of uh, two-dimensional magnetic materials. And uh, that's also a very exciting opportunity for electronic applications. But these are just monolayers. So actually, a lot would happen if you now start stacking those layers on top of each other. And the simplest thing to consider would be just bilayer structures. 
So let's say we have MOS2, uh, which is shown here, and see what happens if we have a second layer of MOS2 on top of the first layer, right? So what you will find is that uh, a monolayer MOS2 is a direct band gap semiconductor. And in terms of properties, it means that uh, if you excite it, it would emit light, right? However, if you just have two layers of MOS2 on top of each other, uh, the material becomes an indirect band gap semiconductor. And now it doesn't uh, shine light. So basically just a stacking of two layers on top of each other uh, in a like a regular AB uh, fashion dramatically changes the properties, right? You can see this, for example, in this picture uh, where uh, you see a, a photoluminescent response. So it's a, a photoluminescent microscopy uh, where you see uh, several triangular MOS2 crystals. So each triangle is a single, single MOS2 crystal. And uh, those which uh, look bright, uh, like this one or this one, are single layer MOS2 materials. So they shine light uh, in response to excitation. However, you see several dark crystals, like this one or this one, and uh, these would be bilayer crystals, so they don't shine light. So this stacking changes property quite, uh, properties quite a lot. And if you look at other materials uh, shown here or other materials that I don't show uh, on the left, uh, the same would happen. Like you put a layer of graphene on top of another layer of graphene uh, and get a bilayer graphene and the band structure changes. And there were quite a lot of studies on that. However, uh, the way you put a second layer uh, could also be different. So if you have a bilayer graphene, uh, it's a semiconductor. And by bilayer graphene, I mean graphene, which has a regular AB stacking uh, prescribed by the crystal structure of graphite. But now imagine that you have two uh, like regularly uh, stacked uh, crystals of uh, graphene, and you slightly twist one layer relative to another and, and stack them like this. So you would get a structure shown uh, in this uh, picture. And uh, that structure would be periodic. And uh, the periodicity of this structure would uh, depend on this um, twist angle theta shown here. Well, it turns out that actually the properties of this new structure would dramatically depend on this uh, twist angle. And at an angle of about 1.1 degrees, which is now known uh, to the community as a magic angle, uh, the bilayer graphene becomes superconductor. So, which uh, I think is really incredible, right? So again, we have two layers. So if we stack them regularly, it's a semiconductor. If we twist them and stack them, so it's a superconductor, which is absolutely remarkable. And uh, then, well, you can think that uh, there are all, also many other uh, two-dimensional materials which uh, could change their properties dramatically if uh, stacked in a proper way. And in terms of material science, it's an absolutely um, incredible opportunity because that's something which just uh, simply does not exist in uh, bulk or conventional uh, materials. Right? So like if you have a perovskite structure, you cannot just take the top face and twist it at an arbitrary angle relative to the uh, bottom face and then measure the properties. It just doesn't work like this, right? Here, well, yes, you can choose any angle you want and um, uh, this particular uh, discovery, as exciting as it is, it's just a tip of an iceberg and many other properties could be found in those twisted structures. And now, of course, uh, why don't we just stack uh, materials of the same kind, like shown uh, for MOS2 and graphene? So in principle, you can create uh, so-called Van der Waals heterostructures, where you can take those uh, monolayers at will and shuffle them in any order you want. And you control the number of layers, the twist angles, um, like, you know, the, well, the environments and so on and so forth. So the number of uh, structures which you create uh, this way uh, is uh, pretty much infinite, right? And uh, for people working in this area, it's a very exciting time because of how many opportunities those structures provide. So I think that uh, for uh, students uh, working in uh, material science or like studying at the Department of Material Science, uh, 
Uh, that's probably the, the most important slide of my presentation uh, because, well, you are trained uh, to uh, create new materials, right? And when you do this, uh, you usually think either of individual atoms as building blocks, right? So you look at the periodic table and think how you would arrange certain atoms to, to make a certain structure with, with certain properties. So those are your building blocks. Or uh, you can think of composite materials. And in this case, you already think of thinking of existing structures with existing properties and think how you can combine those uh, structures in composite, which would retain the uh, original properties of uh, individual materials that you need. So here you see that it's, uh, it's a very similar concept, except that now your building blocks are two-dimensional layers, which are now uh, like, you know, they, which have grown enormously in terms of their number. And again, the number of structures which you can create is, is just infinite. Okay, so that's uh, kind of like my summary of uh, two-dimensional materials, where this all started uh, and uh, where this research uh, came to, to uh, over the last 15 years or so. So now I will give you several examples uh, from my own research. And uh, those will be very diverse examples, just like uh, I'm showing uh, here, like the structures you can make could be very diverse. And each of those projects I will show uh, would uh, target very different applications. But uh, I hope that uh, just like this slide or the slides I showed uh, before, uh, they will reinforce the idea that, well, with two-dimensional materials, uh, the sky is the limit and you can make lots of different things. Okay, so these are the uh, topics uh, which I will briefly summarize and uh, I don't intend to go much into detail for any of those um, projects and just want to give you a basic idea what these projects are about and uh, what we're trying to do. So in, in the first case, we'll talk about the atomically precise graphene nanoribbons. And uh, just like I showed you a moment ago, uh, where you, even with a single graphene uh, sheet, you can uh, create different structures with different properties. So stacking is one way to change the properties of graphene, but carving graphene into smaller structures is another way. And uh, this was actually shown theoretically long before uh, samples of graphene uh, were isolated uh, using a scotch tape approach uh, by several theoretical groups, uh, for example, this group um, by Nakada et al., uh, which showed that if you have a very narrow strip of graphene, for example, shown here, where the arrows show you the direction of the ribbon, uh, or this one, depending on the edge, structure, so which could be either armchair as here or zigzag as here. Uh, and uh, the width, the properties could be very different. So for example, for this particular ribbon, if you have uh, only uh, four carbon atoms across, like imagine like you have like one, two, three, four, like a very narrow ribbon. So it should have a band gap. So it's a semiconductor. However, if you just add one ribbon to the edge, so uh, it have, and have n equal five, this ribbon becomes metallic. There's no band gap. You add one more carbon atom to the edge and um, you open a band gap again. So what this shows you uh, is, is that even for this uh, family of uh, armchair nanoribbons, uh, you can already create uh, structures with very different properties. Uh, but uh, if you look at a family of zigzag ribbons, you can also achieve other pro properties like, for example, edge magnetism. So now if you think about this collectively, you, you realize that uh, if you start combining those ribbons with each other, uh, you can create uh, very ex exciting heterostructures. For example, in this uh, uh, picture, I show a result of a theoretical study uh, which demonstrated that if you have uh, uh, two uh, zigzag edged ribbons, which are metallic or highly conductive, connected with an armchair ribbon, which is a semiconductor, essentially you have a very nice uh, field effect transistor structure that is extremely small. So it's just a few nanometers across, but it's functional. So then if you look at uh, the zigzag ribbons, uh, so they could be used uh, for spintronic devices because they have magnetic uh, states at the edges. Uh, 
And the very fact that, okay, carbon has magnetism, well, it's not uh, that shocking these days. There are other examples, but uh, well, it's still quite unusual. And uh, one very uh, interesting recent development uh, came out also from theory, and it's shown at the bottom. And uh, the idea is that if you have uh, two different ribbons and you fuse them properly into a heterostructure, um, well, if you've, done, if you've done this right, you can create a topological state, topological electronic state at the interface. So you have two ribbons, one is this wide and the other one is this wide. If you fuse them as shown here, nothing interesting happens at the interface. But if you fuse them like this, you create a localized topological state at this point. And uh, this is very interesting for um, uh, qubit research, quantum computing. So things which are really popular these days um, for you know, future research um, in applications. So uh, how could you make these structures? Well, first thought would be, okay, you start with graphene and just remove the unnecessary parts, do lithography. However, this doesn't work because the structures which I showed you in the previous slide are too small for that. So if you just do regular patterning, you, know, you can achieve structures that would be like 10 nanometers wide at best, right? But uh, the structures I showed there would be like an order of magnitude smaller. And also, uh, there is a very strict requirement uh, to the edge quality. And uh, if you do like rough etching or other top-down uh, approaches, such as like unzipping of carbon nanotubes, for example, the edges which you achieve uh, would be pretty rough on the atomic scale. And that's not good enough. Uh, a revolution in, the, in this field uh, happened in 2010 when a group of Klaus Müller and Roman Fazel uh, demonstrated that you can create such uh, ribbons bottom up by coupling properly designed molecular precursors. So one example would be uh, here, where you have this molecule that you deposit on a single crystal gold. And uh, if uh, you raise the temperature, so these molecules couple into a polymer and at higher temperature, they planarize and produce very nice ribbons. And you can see them in the microscopy images. And the very nice thing about this approach is that it's very flexible such that uh, you can use other molecules, such as for example, the one shown here, uh, that could be also be coupled into a polymer and then uh, produce a ribbon, but the structure of this ribbon will be very different. And this means that if you have all those nice ribbons uh, predicted by theory uh, to have all those nice properties, uh, you can start thinking about proper molecules which would uh, couple and give you those ribbons uh, and then you can test them for different applications. So in this field, uh, there are now two uh, general directions or two general approaches so one is known as on-surface approach, and that's the one which I just showed uh, in the previous slide. So where you do the chemistry on the surface uh, of a, a metal substrate in a high vacuum. However, uh, you can also make these ribbons in a solution. And that was uh, one of our early contributions to this, group, uh, to, to this field uh, when we showed that, well, you can start, for example, with the same molecule but you can couple it uh, into a polymer using Yamamoto coupling approach with nickel zero uh, catalyst. And then you can cyclize um, these polymers into ribbons uh, also in solution uh, using iron uh, three uh, chloride, so-called Scholl reaction. So in this case, you can produce large quantities of ribbons um, such as shown here for this vial, which contains like almost a gram, um, oh, sorry, actually it was much less than that. Uh, of uh, GNRs, and if you image them, you see that, well, they look as nice as the ribbons made uh, on surfaces. So we tried this approach for many different molecules. Uh, so this is the most recent um, result, which is just about to be published. So where we developed this molecule, and in this case, we use three plate uh, groups instead of um, halogens as the leaving groups. Uh, it gives you a ribbon like this which you can image. So these are the scanning tunneling microscopy pictures showing that, okay, the ribbon stock is, is intended. Or uh, this molecule, which is also different, uh, it gave us uh, a ribbon uh, that we call laterally extended, chevron GNR or eGNR. So in a, a comparison to the original chevron, so it has this extra phenyl, 
in the, in the elbow positions. And that makes them a little bit more conductive, which is important for applications. So what kind of applications uh, we're working on, the one which was uh, the most successful so far was uh, gas sensing. So it was actually quite unexpected, but uh, these ribbons worked uh, remarkably well for that. So what we would do is uh, we would uh, make um, self-assembled monolayers uh, of these ribbons. And uh, actually Mike Shekherev, uh, another uh, alum from uh, Moscow State University uh, who did PhD in my group, actually developed this technique, how to make those nice films. And then uh, those films of self-assembled ribbons could be put on uh, a substrate with electrodes uh, where you can measure the uh, electrical conductivity. So what we found that the conductivity of uh, these films uh, responds quite dramatically to various uh, low molecular weight alcohols, such as methanol or ethanol. And uh, without going much into details, you see that the responses uh, could be as high as um, like thousand percent or more. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, these numbers are really remarkable, especially for the uh, field of uh, gas sensors based on uh, carbon materials. So you look at uh, typical sensors uh, in literature uh, based on carbon nanotubes or, or graphene, or graphene oxide, and in similar conditions, similar experiments, uh, they would show responses on the order of just a few percent. So we have an improvement by almost three orders of magnitude. And we think that uh, it's a combination of uh, several factors which makes uh, those films uh, so sensitive. Uh, one would be that uh, they are semiconductive in nature. And if you think about sensors, generally good sensors are made of semiconductors, right? Like if you have a copper wire or aluminum foil, it's not a good sensor material, right? But at the same time, uh, these films have a very unique morphology, uh, which enable easy intercalation of the analyte molecules between the ribbons. And when this happens, the inter-ribbon uh, conductivity uh, decreases dramatically, so which manifests in uh, a highly increased uh, resistance. So it's the combination of two factors we think, but again, the result is that, yeah, these are um, the best carbon-based sensors uh, reported in literature, at least that's what we believe based on the available data. Okay, so there are lots of other structures which could be made. And again, I sort of reinforce this idea of tunable properties and uh, the potential. So I will not spend much time on those, just mention that in principle, you can make ribbons with different heteroatoms like nitrogens in those positions shown here or here. Uh, but uh, we're also active in making ribbons by the on-surface coupling. And in this case, I'll just remind you, so we would start with a molecule, deposit it on uh, a gold substrate in a vacuum. And if we anneal uh, the system, so those structures would gradually transform into ribbons. So that extended chevron GNR, which I just showed a couple of slides ago, could also be made on the surface. So in this case, you would uh, have the uh, molecule which we developed, uh, deposited uh, and anneal. And uh, that's what we would get. So uh, the top image in this case is a scanning tunneling microscopy image. And I think that uh, most people are familiar with this technique. But I will specifically comment on the bottom image because it's probably not a common place uh, these days. It's called uh, non-contact AFM or non-contact atomic force microscopy. And well, I believe everybody knows about the, the AFM. So you have a very sharp tip which oscillates uh, over the surface and uh, that's how you create an image. But uh, the thing about non-contact AFM here is that you have an extremely sharp tip because you catch a single carbon monoxide molecule uh, at the very end. So a single CO molecule is your tip, which probably makes it the sharpest tip you can think of. And this tip would be so sharp that you can uh, resolve fine details such as individual benzene rings. So again, this is not like a simulation or uh, well, Photoshop or whatever, right? So it's a real, real experimental image uh, that uh, shows you how such ribbon looks like. And uh, you can even tell that uh, in this particular place, one of those fennels uh, somehow decided to leave 
uh, when it, uh, the structure was unmilled. So you can resolve those defects very nicely. So we do those imaging um, experiments at uh, Brookhaven National Laboratory and uh, Percy Zal is a genius of uh, this method. So we really enjoy our collaboration with him. Yeah, and uh, once the ribbons are made on substrates, we can measure their electronic properties, such as the band gap. So when you have different molecules, uh, you can also think about uh, very small electronic uh, structures. And uh, the easiest way would be to couple different molecules with each other. So for instance, if you have different molecules, which I showed in, in the previous slides, and co-deposit them on a, on a substrate, uh, you can create heterostructures. And in those heterostructures, you have uh, semiconductors uh, with different band gaps. So like each of those segments would have different band gaps, either it's this one or this one, uh, in a very close proximity. So you create really tiny heterojunctions and there's a number of electronic applications for those. So another work uh, which uh, I also want to uh, briefly discuss, and again, it's work by Mike Shekherev, um, so which he did uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, which shows that uh, by proper modification of the molecules, uh, you can also induce their self-assembly. So here the idea is that uh, we would start with this original molecule, uh, molecule one, and uh, we would modify it in a way that we would attach those extra phenyls um, to, to make a molecule four. So the difference between one and four is that when four is uh, polymerized and then cyclized, you have those uh, dangling phenyls and uh, they really want to engage in the pi pi interactions with the phenyls from like neighboring or adjacent uh, polymer chains and later ribbons. So when we put those on surfaces, what you see is that uh, you have those um, polymer chains which I showed in the previous slide, but they are highly aligned with each other, right? Like, for example, look at this region and you see that there's a very good alignment. And that's because, well, the phenyls are tilted on the surface and they like to engage in the pi-pi interaction. As a result, uh, when you actually uh, planarize the structures, uh, the ribbons are highly parallel to each other and uh, they can fuse and produce uh, graphene nanopores. So there are two uh, scenarios how this could happen, and this is shown uh, in uh, the right part of the slide. So you have two polymers, and then once they produce ribbons, there are two ways how the cross fusion could happen. So it could happen either when the phenyls on uh, the uh, bottom ribbon cycle uh, fuse with the phenyls of the top ribbon to the right or to the left. And depending on which way they go, you can actually make uh, structures with different uh, geometries of graphene nanopores. So one geometry would be like this, where you have the identical pores, or the other one would be like this, where you have pores with different shape. And we can see both of those uh, by microscopy. And that's just another uh, visualization of one of those arrangements, where you see that those pores are made uh, with atomic precision and they are identical. So that's uh, actually something that uh, is just starting as a direction in our research, but I'll just mention that uh, graphene nanopores uh, are currently pretty much a subfield of graphene research because lots of uh, exciting properties have been uh, predicted for the pores that are made into proper shapes and proper sizes. So you can modify electronic properties. Uh, there are lots of predictions uh, on uh, the possibility of DNA sequencing. If you have a proper pore and you pass a DNA strand through. Uh, and uh, you can think of applications like molecular seeding or uh, separation and so on. So this approach, which I just described, uh, really ena enables um, making such pores with atomic precision. Because if you want a pore of a certain shape, you can again design a molecule which would produce structures with pores of that shape. And uh, to conclude the ribbon part, I'll just mention that in principle, it's possible to uh, produce uh, such nanopores even within single ribbons. And uh, we think of those structures as uh, hybrids of ribbons and uh, other types of nanostructured graphene called graphene nanomeshes. So that's 
how such structure would look like. It's a ribbon, but you have periodic pores within it. And this could also be made uh, if you again modify a molecule like this uh, with extra phenyls, but now in other positions. And when these molecules couple and give you a ribbon, uh, you can have a structure which does have such nicely arranged uh, periodic pores, uh, which could be visualized by both uh, scanning tunneling microscopy and non contact AFM. Okay, it looks like, um, um, like, Time, time is flying, right? So I think uh, it's actually a good time for me to uh, now move to another project which uh, I wanted to talk about. And uh, in the beginning, I've mentioned uh, transition metal calcogenides, right? And uh, one structure which uh, I specifically showed you was MOS2. So that's the structure which you see uh, on, on the left in this slide. So uh, this structure is two-dimensional and uh, a moment ago, I was just talking about uh, graphene nanoribbons and making a case that a lot of interesting things happen if you go from a two-dimensional graphene to a one-dimensional graphene nanoribbon, right? So, so, so properties change dramatically. So if you think about calcogenides, uh, would there be any analogs of 2D calcogenides? Uh, so in other words, calcogenide structures that are confined in 1D. And as a matter of fact, um, well, such structures exist, and uh, there's a pretty large family of so-called transition metal tricalcogenides. So now you have three calcogens uh, per metal, as opposed to two calcogens here, right? So what this extra calcogen, like sulfur or selenium, does is that it creates uh, disulfur bridges, um, which are shown here, for example, or here. And as a result, the bonding would not be to the next, um, like, you know, um, metal like coordination sphere, but uh, the bonding would be confined like, you know, on the same unit, right? So what this means is that now the isotropic structure of MOS2 and 2D becomes anisotropic uh, and um, the properties like within those one dimensional chains and across them uh, would be very different. So that's another rendering of the structure. So you still have those 2D layers, but the layers of uh, tricalcogenides consist of one-dimensional chains, which you see here. And that's a TEM image, which actually shows you a, a structure of one of those crystals, like TIS2, TIS3, uh, where such chains are clearly visible. So why this is interesting is because uh, now, uh, just like in case of uh, graphene nanoribbons, uh, where the primary motivation of uh, that research uh, was making ultra small uh, electronic devices, right? So the ones which would be made of, um, of a single ribbon. So here you can uh, put forward the same idea and, and say, what if uh, we could isolate such individual chains and create uh, electronic devices of a very small size as well. And by the way, uh, this material is naturally semiconducting, so there's no reason to like, actually pay that much attention to the band gap as uh, in case of uh, GNRs. So we actually uh, worked uh, with the materials from this family quite a lot, and it looks like the exfoliation, like the simple scotch tape exfoliation, works in such a way that uh, producing individual chains is actually possible. So when you put a piece of scotch tape on top of a crystal of TIS3, and such crystals are shown uh, here, and uh, peel it off, uh, the exfoliation proceeds as shown in this schematic, such that you break uh, weak uh, Van der Waals interactions, not only between the layers, but also between the chains within the layers. And you can see this by AFM. So if you take an AFM uh, image of uh, a surface of such exploited crystal, you see those periodic lines, which all have the same height of about one nanometer. So that's the thickness of uh, like in individual TIS3 layers, which is now broken into separate chains. So the thing that this material uh, has an incredible potential for electronics because again, it has a band gap, and the band gap actually is, is of a good magnitude. So it's about one EV, so it's comparable to silicon. But unlike silicon, where at those dimensions you would have uh, problems with uh, like proper doping and dangling bones and such, so here you actually have a material that is intrinsically uh, semiconducting, has a robust band gap, uh, pretty high mobilities uh, predicted by theory, 
Um, so yeah, there's a lot of reason to study electronic properties of it. So we did exfoliation by different uh, techniques. Uh, for example, we can actually sc um, scrap this uh, the surface with a tip of an atomic force microscope. And as you could imagine, if you do it along the chains, uh, you create uh, such like nicely defined grooves in the material. But if you do this across the chains, well, breaking covalent bonds within the chains is difficult. So you don't create such grooves and instead you slide layers and yes, holes, right? So we actually made some progress and uh, we did create uh, devices uh, which uh, were not based on single chains yet, but uh, pretty narrow TIS3 nano ribbons. Uh, so these devices showed uh, some very promising properties like uh, mobility is comparable to those of MOS2, uh, kind of like a benchmark uh, calcogenite material these days, uh, high on off ratios and so on. So, and, and there's a lot of interesting physics there as well. For example, we recently discovered a metal insulator transition uh, in the TIS3 crystals. Okay, so now uh, what about the actual calcogenites? And uh, would uh, we be interested in doing research with those? Well, sure. And uh, one uh, like particularly large direction uh, that my group is pursuing is uh, the investigation of uh, the devices that are made of uh, two-dimensional materials uh, and uh, ferroelectric materials. So in case of you uh, well, didn't take a materials course from Professor Budilin yet uh, on uh, ferroelectric materials, so these are materials with a spontaneous polarization. So in other words, uh, in a polarized form, you can think of this uh, layer of, uh, say, barium titanate a classical ferroelectric in a way that, uh, let's say, one the surface of it would be like positively charged and the other one would be negatively charged. So you have an intrinsic polarization uh, within this layer. And uh, I was talking a lot about uh, combining different 2D materials into interesting heterostructures. Well, the same logic could actually be applied to combining 2D materials with other materials in, in general. And in case of uh, ferroelectric, it makes uh, perfect sense because the actual useful property of a ferroelectric is its polarization, right? So it's basically this electric field which such film creates. If you put a material that is only one atom thick or well, like a few layers thick, but still very thin, right? So the electric field would easily penetrate in the material, which means that the coupling between the 2D material and the ferroelectric will be strong. Right, so it's very different from like placing a bulk material on top of a ferroelectric, where the electric field would not be able to penetrate through. So, which means that uh, yeah, it's kind of like a natural uh, combination, uh, which is promising for devices. And there are two types of devices that we are studying. So we are studying uh, ferroelectric tunnel junctions, which are basically capacitors, uh, where we would have a ferroelectric uh, dielectric and uh, graphene or other 2D material is one of the electrodes and we would measure the current across the structure or uh, field effect transistors so where the polarization of the uh, ferroelectric material would be used to control the transfer within the channel of the 2D material so it's an in-plane transport here and out-of-plane transport here so uh, there are lots of things you can do. So one uh, example, and I like it because it's when you actually utilize uh, several exciting properties of graphene. So I told you originally that um, it doesn't have just one exciting properties, but many. And here we would uh, utilize two things. First, that the graphene is conductive. And second, that gra graphene, because, uh, well, uh, the bonds are short and the rings are small, right? So it's, it's impermeable to atoms and molecules, right? So which means that it's a very nice uh, encapsulating layer uh, such that if you put a layer of molecules, for example, uh, on the surface and cover those molecules with graphene, so the molecules will be trapped, so they cannot leave. So here we showed that uh, we can create a very nice hybrid uh, ferroelectric tunnel, uh, tunnel and junction devices, uh, which would be hybrid structures. So where we would have ferroelectric, graphene, and also a molecular layer, such as the layer of ammonia molecules, uh, 
And uh, without going much into details, uh, I will say that uh, ammonia molecules had a dramatic um, uh, effect on the device performance, and uh, they were really encapsulated, so which uh, made uh, those structures stable and the measurements reproducible. So in principle, other molecular layers could be encapsulated well, in this system or on other substrates with graphene or other 2D materials, if necessary. So that's another example of such structure, uh, but in this case, uh, we used uh, MOS2 instead of graphene. And uh, the idea here would be that, um, like the key message of the slide, is that uh, here we actually have a very interesting interplay of uh, properties of uh, the um, like ferroelectric layer and uh, the calcogenite layer. Because uh, MOS2 is a semiconductor, right? So it's an anti semiconductor, meaning that if you uh, dope it with electrons, it's highly conductive, right? But if you dope it with holes, uh, well, it's non-conductive. So this doping could actually be created by the polarization of the substrate, right? And what this means is that if you uh, have a flake, so that's a flake of MOS2 on the barium titanate substrate, and you put a, a tip of uh, a scanning probe microscope over a certain point, and you apply a pulse to change the uh, polarization of uh, the substrate below. So you see that uh, if uh, you dope uh, the um, substrate one way, the structure, like the moisture structure is conductive, right? If you dope it the other way, it's non-conductive. And as a result, uh, if you create a complex polarization uh, pattern, like let's say you polarize some regions of uh, the uh, substrate one way and other regions the other way. So you can create complex uh, conductivity patterns uh, within the material. So this is shown in this series of images where the dots uh, represent the direction of the polarization. So the yellow color is the polarization downward and uh, the dark uh, brown color is the polarization upward. And basically, that's the, that's the edge of the MOS2 flake, and that's the flake itself. And uh, what you see is that uh, in those regions, right, so you have uh, the polarization uh, of the substrate going downward, and there the material, meaning the MOS2, uh, is conductive. But uh, it's the conductive MOS2 in a matrix of non-conductive uh, MOS2 because in the other regions it's polarized in the opposite direction. So you can actually create uh, interesting uh, conductivity patterns uh, within the material. And uh, to, I'll, just, I'll come back to those pictures, but uh, to show you what you can do with it is that you can actually make a device, so where you have two electrodes and the, an MOS2 channel on a ferroelectric, and you can draw such uh, conduct, uh, conductivity patterns with a tip on this MOS2, uh, like on a canvas. Right? So imagine like you have a device which is truly uh, reconfigurable because you can draw any kinds of conductive channels like you want. And you can draw them, you can erase them, you can draw them again, you can change their geometrical uh, characteristics and so on and so forth. And uh, that's just one example um, how this is done. So that's the uh, flake of uh, MOS2 between two electrodes. And uh, here uh, it is shown in a non-conductive state. And now we use a tip to create a conductive line. Um, so the device becomes conductive. So that's how it looks in conductive state. And then you can erase this line and the conductivity goes down and you can repeat this process uh, multiple times. Or like if you want, you can draw like one line, two lines, three lines and so on. And uh, each time you do this, uh, while well, the conductivity increases. So it's a pretty sophisticated device, uh, but I think it, again, nicely illustrates this idea that uh, the two-dimensional materials first have very diverse properties, and second, they could be coupled with other structures uh, to create uh, like a very interesting materials or device systems. I'll just come, come back a couple of slides and uh, explain like what I wanted to show here. So that's another interesting property which we discovered in uh, the uh, MOS2 or other calcogenides uh, on uh, ferroelectric substrates. And that is that the polarization of the substrate could be switched uh, not only by a tip 
and applying electric pulse. That's how normally the electric polarization is switched, right? But optically. So you can shine light on the MOS2 and uh, the MOS2 being a semi semiconductor material uh, would uh, create charge carriers which uh, with their own uh, like electric field which changes the polarization of the substrate below. So what you see here is that image which where again the uh, color shows you the direction of the polarization. So this yellow color originally shows that uh, the entire substrate is uh, polarized downwards. Right? And then uh, what you do is that you start scanning this uh, in the darkness. So remember in, in AFM, the tip goes back and forth like this. And at this particular point, you turn on the light. And what you see that uh, immediately the color changes, uh, meaning that the polarization uh, of the substrate changed. So now you basically erased the original polarization. And importantly, this uh, happened only on the area uh, which is covered by MOS2. So like this bottom part here, you see it remained uh, yellow as shown here. So this PZT or this ferroelectric material was not affected, but uh, MOS2, which was irradiated, affected the polarization of the substrate below. And that also uh, has uh, some interesting device applications because now you can think of devices uh, which you can switch not only electrically, how you would normally do this, but optical. Well, we have optical devices as well, right? Like a CD uh, drive is an example where you actually have writing in the reading operations like with lasers, right? But now you have a structure where you can actually do both. So like imagine you have an array of uh, such MOS2 devices and originally they're programmed into these states. So you have like 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, or whatever states, right? So now you can do what I showed you previously, like you can shine light, and this would erase everything, right? So actually the polarization would uh, go from the downward polarization, like for those zero states, uh, to, well, actually mixed states, but closer to the ones. So you can erase everything optically, and then if you want, you can write uh, a different uh, structure uh, of bits electrically. Or you can do it oppositely. You can actually uh, erase everything electrically and then write things optically in the same manner as you would do in a CD drive, right? Like a focused laser would irradiate uh, those uh, zero states and turn them into one state. So it's a very unusual device structure. And again, it's because of the coupling of the 2D materials properties and the ferroelectric properties. Okay, so finally, uh, I want to talk about maxines. And again, I don't want to talk too much about them because uh, again, there was an excellent lecture by Professor Gagotsen recently. So it's online, I believe, so you can listen at any time. Uh, I just want to uh, comment on uh, what kind of opportunity I see in this area uh, from the device perspective. So just as a reminder, uh, maxines are two-dimensional uh, carbides, uh, nitrides, or um, sometimes mixtures of the two uh, of uh, transition metals. And they come from very interesting structures called max phases. So they were uh, advanced by Michel Barzoum group in Drexel University over many years. So in 2011, uh, Razum Gagotze collaboratively showed that if you have such layered uh, max phases, uh, where you have M as one of those transition uh, metals, A as one of those elements, and X again is either carbon or nitrogen in a layered fashion, and uh, subject uh, these crystals to etching, you can selectively etch away the A element and as a result, you would have layered materials uh, where only M and X are left. So those layers without the A elements there uh, delaminate and they produce two dimensional sheets, which we know as maxines. And uh, there's currently a lot of excitement about this area because uh, the number of uh, predicted and experimentally demonstrated max phases is very large meaning that uh, the number of potential maxines that could be made is also very large. So it's, it's a very large addition uh, to the family of the already large family of 2D materials. And uh, when uh, originally we looked at those papers, uh, so they were, they were like 
nature and science papers. Uh, and uh, those papers primarily had um, shown applications of maxines in energy storage. So you can make those structures in bulk and then you can process them into like, you know, like supercapacitors, batteries and so on, which is, which is great because in the end of the day, we are mostly interested in applications. But the thing is that uh, this was not exactly how the field of 2D materials, other 2D materials like graphene uh, to start with uh, generally developed. So I showed you this slide uh, in the beginning and uh, you see that, okay, well, there was an isolation of graphene. So then uh, there were extensive measurements of all kinds of intrinsic physical properties of uh, graphene, right? So electrical properties, uh, mechanical properties, optical properties, thermal properties, and some other things. And uh, now uh, the focus of this research uh, like is, is really on applications, like how you utilize those properties in different areas. In case of Maxines, it was interesting because uh, uh, like the original inventors uh, of Maxines immediately realized that okay, they're perfect for applications such as energy storage, right? But uh, this step where intrinsic measurements of like individual single crystals of Maxines uh, was pretty much skipped. And uh, we thought that it was an opportunity because again, we learned from like other uh, to the materials and uh, the corresponding papers and such, uh, how this should be done. So we collaborated with uh, the Gagotsi group uh, and uh, started this uh, by working with uh, titanium carbide uh, maxine, which is made by uh, exfoliation uh, and delamination of the uh, titanium aluminum carbide crystals. So if you etch those crystals properly, you remove the aluminum layers and produce maxine sheets, right? And in those bottom images, you can see uh, very nice uh, ACM and TM images of uh, those sheets. They could be several micrometers in size. And then uh, what uh, Alexei Lipatov did, by the way, he's also an alum of uh, the Department of Material Science, and he's currently working with me as a research professor. Uh, so he uh, isolated some of those crystals uh, on uh, proper substrates. Like you can see one of those crystals here. Uh, created uh, microscale electrodes. In this case, he used uh, chromium and uh, gold and measured the conductivity. And he found that the conductivity was uh, very large. So, but now those are the measurements derived from like, single crystals, not from like bulk structures where you have lots of interfaces, etc. Et so those uh, numbers which were produced in uh, this paper were actually representative of uh, the material itself and not the microscopic structures with their own you know, problems. Um, I should say that uh, the maxines are improving. So we can, we can see that they are getting better and be better as the synthetic approaches uh, develop. And uh, I wouldn't say that these are the record numbers. So clearly like the new generation of maxines uh, should be more conductive. But again, the thing that um, proper measurement of those materials and their benchmarking uh, should be done like this, where it's a single crystal uh, isolated uh, and patterned and then measured in high vacuum conditions to uh, eliminate all kinds of uh, det detrimental effects on the conductivity. Okay, and uh, the second thing which is also um, well, obvious, in my opinion, uh, was to measure the, the, the mechanical uh, properties of maxines. Well, we know from uh, the properties of bulk uh, carbides that they are very strong mechanically, right? Carbides are often used as protective coatings, abrasive materials, and so on. Uh, so there were, were all reasons to expect that uh, individual layers uh, of uh, maxines uh, would produce very nice mechanical properties. So again, that was something which people did for other 2D materials, but not maxines. So we decided to uh, fill uh, this uh, gap in knowledge. So again, Alexei Lipatov uh, did this experiment. He uh, created um, maxine membranes uh, where he would put individual monolayer and bilayer flakes uh, onto a substrate with uh, pre-patterned holes. And they use a tip of uh, an atomic force microscope to uh, push those uh, membranes, membranes down 
and measure uh, how much force you need uh, to push the center of a membrane down by a certain certain distance. So that's basically the result of this measurement, like a force deflection curve. So basically the more force you apply, the more down uh, the tip of the uh, microscope goes, right? So from such curve, you can actually extract uh, important mechanical characteristics, um, such as uh, Young's modulus, which we primarily wanted to find. So what I found is that uh, actually, if you put a graphene membrane, and we uh, basically reproduced uh, the earlier results um, on graphene, uh, and uh, such curve for Maxi, so they look very similar, right? So they're very close, uh, but uh, you should keep in mind that um, uh, a graphene membrane is approximately like th three times thinner than a Maxi membrane, right? So which means that the, elast the elastic uh, Young's modulus of graphene from uh, those estimates must be th about three times higher. So which is the case? So in case of graphene, so this is the record for 2D materials right now, it's uh, in 1,000 uh, gigapascals. But uh, Maxine's with uh, 330 uh, uh, gigapascals uh, are actually not that far away. And actually, if you make a proper comparison, not with like nice and uh, tiny single crystals of uh, graphene, but with large scale uh, materials such as graphene oxide, which could be created again, like in uh, large quantities, similar to Maxine's. So you see that actually Maxine's beat uh, graphene oxide. So graphene oxide is here. So in similar measurements, it showed approximately uh, 200 uh, gigapascals were, while Maxine's were about 50% uh, better. So which means that Maxine's are very promising for a number of applications is um, reinforcement additives to different composites, uh, polymer composites, uh, for membranes, um, and so on. So which adds to the already impressive uh, like suite of potential applications of these materials. Okay, so I'm summarizing. And first, again, I want to remind uh, you about this slide. And the key message here is that there are lots of 2D materials with different properties. So that's the left column, right? And then those 2D materials are not limited to just single layer form. They could be uh, made in bilayer structures, twisted bilayer structures, and those offer lots of other properties. And they could be combined in heterostructures. So I didn't show you Van der Waals uh, heterostructure research, uh, but I showed you heterostructures with stereoelectrics. And you could see that uh, they gain new and exciting properties that those materials individually don't have. And uh, similar ideas would be applied to uh, Van der Waals heterostructures of uh, 2D materials with different properties. And then, yeah, I talked about uh, three different uh, research directions, um, like atomically precise graphene nanoribbons, uh, electronics based on uh, various transition metal calcogenides, and maxines. So I would be glad to comment on any of those directions, but uh, collectively they mean to show you how diverse uh, the field of 2D materials is and how many things you can possibly make with, with them. And finally, of course, I would like to acknowledge uh, the great collaborators that um, I enjoy working with. Um, so there are several people at UNL, like Axel Anders, Alexey Gruberman, Peter Dalben, uh, Yuri Gagotze uh, at Drexel uh, provided all these magazine materials. Uh, people at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign uh, contributed uh, to understanding the properties of graphene and ribbons. And I mentioned uh, Percy Zal, a genius uh, microscopist from uh, Brookhaven National Laboratory. And of course, students, postdocs uh, who did the work, well, I didn't do any of that, of course, so it was all them, and credit goes to them as well and the funding. So thank you, and uh, I would be glad to answer any questions you might have.